We are recording, so welcome to the December version of our episode of the Project One Task Force for Multicultural Awareness and Cultural Competency. Uh, my name is James McKim, and I'll be your host for the um, events tonight, the webcast. And we are uh, very pleased to uh, have with us tonight uh, Ms. Jane Redmond, who is a member of the Province One Task Force for Cultural Awareness and Multicultural Competency. Uh, she is a retreat leader and spiritual director and author of When in Doubt, Sing, Prayer in Daily Life, uh, which we're going to be uh, drawing from, which she'll be drawing from uh, during the webcast tonight. She's a member of the Emanuel Church in Boston and serves as a congregational consultant in the Diocese of Massachusetts, is a member of the Bishop's Commission for Ecumenical and Interreligious Relations. She's worked in parish campus and urban ministries and taught theology and religious studies in California and North Carolina. And during her time in North Carolina, she was actually uh, a, served as chair of the Bishop's Committee for Racial Justice and Reconciliation. So we're very pleased to have Jane with us to uh, share some thoughts about prayer as we do this work of uh, becoming uh, culturally aware and uh, multiculturally competent. So uh, we always like to start our webcasts off with uh, an opening prayer. Uh, so uh, Julie, do we have the prayer? Do you want to put that up and we can uh, start off with that prayer and I can, I can pray us in? Yep. Yep. Great, thank you very much. Let us pray. My soul proclaims your greatness, O oh my God, and my spirit has rejoiced in you, my Savior, for your regard has blessed me poor and a serving woman. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. For you who are mighty have made me great. Most holy be your name. Your mercy is on those who fear you throughout all generations. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their heart's fantasy. You have put down the mighty from their seat and have lifted up the powerless. You have filled the hungry with good things and have sent the rich away empty. You, remembering your mercy, have helped your people Israel. As you promised Abraham and Sarah, mercy to their children forever. Amen. Thank you for that. So to get us started, um, as we like to do for all of our webcasts, we ask a couple of questions of you folks who are viewing, and we'd love for you to get your chat um, area ready to type in your uh, thoughts and responses. So first question, kind of a, a context setting for, for us here and for Jane. Um, why are you here? What brought you here? What, what you must have had some some desire to learn something. Um, what brought you here? Type that into the chat if you would. Uh, we have a few coming in. Uh, Stacy says, my spiritual director thought this would be good for me. She sent me to, the, to this this morning, so great, good, good. Um, Elaine says, I was attracted by the topic and reliance on prayer is the underpinning for positive change. Uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, we'll be absolutely talking about that uh, as we proceed here. 
others. Uh, why are you here? Or what, what do you want to get out of this time that we have? The, the next 44 minutes, roughly. Uh, we have from Elizabeth, insights to deepen my prayer life. Excellent. As a desire to get out of this. Um, we have this fall, I did a course at St. James, New London on spirituality and racial reconciliation. And now we have formed a working group on racial reconciliation. Uh, so that's, uh, so uh, that's New London, New Hampshire. That's, um, so that would be uh, Reverend Jay McLeod being the rector there, right? Um, oh, sorry, not St. James, New London. Saint, uh, that's, a, that's a different New London. Um, St. James, New London. I think that's Connecticut? Not sure where that is. That's Connecticut? 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 Okay. Excellent. Excellent. A um, couple of others here. Topic sounds interesting. I like participating in most of these webinars. So great. Thank you, Matt. Um, Elizabeth, other Elizabeths, Praisner, says, I think we can underrate prayer as an actual force in our lives. Absolutely. And the world doesn't often see the value of prayer at all. We are going to talk about the value of that. Absolutely. Um, and Catherine says, I'm here because I think we can't get to too much about these issues. And as convener of our intercessory prayer group, I thought there might be things to share with the group. I'm hoping that mm -hmm. you will get them things out of this to share with your group yeah so thank you all for sharing um, your, your thoughts with that and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jane now to, to go through a few uh, kind of basics about prayer foundation aspects mm -hmm. of prayer um, and, and then we'll we've got a number of other topics that will allow you to choose from as we have limited time and we want to be able to, to, to get into a few topics uh, with some depth after, after Jane talks about an introduction to prayer. And you should see in front of you a, a document that shows uh, kind of 12 areas that, that Jane has identified as being important to discuss around prayer. And she's gonna talk about the first four and then we'll break and then let you choose uh, what we want to concentrate on for the rest of the session. So Jane, thanks so much for being here and uh, love to can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm really, really glad you're here. And I look forward to hearing from you um, because as I will be saying later on, um, we really never pray alone. Even when we pray alone, we don't pray alone. Um, so I want to go through a uh, a few things at the beginning uh, that are kind of premises for prayer. And those of you who are here because you're interested in the difference between prayer and racial reconciliation will notice that there aren't always explicit mentions, mostly not on, um, on this outline of topics like race and culture. They come up in all of them. Um, so, um, just to let you know that, um, in item one, I just want to talk about some assumptions, um, that I'm making as I talk. Um, they may not be yours, but they're where I'm starting from and they, uh, kind of underlie, uh, everything else I'm going to say. Um, I call this prayer in the work of justice. I used to call it prayer and the work of justice. Uh, and um, I've always felt that you can't really separate contemplation from action or prayer from um, work of making systemic, social, racial, economic, and other change. Um, and I thought that by saying prayer in the work of justice, it would focus us on how essential prayer is in the work of justice, also because there's um, quite a bit of faith-based organizing going on now, which is a really wonderful thing, community organizing that is um, based in various congregations, not just Christian, but Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist. Um, and uh, they are, um, those kinds of projects use faith 
communities as a base, but they don't necessarily involve people in shared spiritual practice. Um, so first assumption I wanted to make that um, these things belong together. Um, I want to talk also, I want to say that uh, in health, spirituality, and justice, um, for me, are connected, and for us, they need to be, that there is a real connection between wholeness and holiness. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the body some later on. So you're going to hear me talk about, and perhaps you'll share also um, some of your own practices that um, are practices of prayer, but they're also practices of health and sanity. Um, we'll talk later, if you want, about the, the new stream and what to do with our devices. And, um, and you're going to go, well, is this about prayer? And um, to my mind, this is. Uh, and things that are healthy prayer practice are also related to how we spend our days and how the balance of noise and silence works uh, in our lives and how culture enters into our prayer. Um, so, uh, the third thing is, uh, I'm going to use the words prayer and spiritual practice. Um, spiritual practice is broader than prayer. It includes prayer. Um, I've come to use that word a lot, both because I spent 10 years in California and everybody in California is a little bit Buddhist. Um, and it's a, it's a Buddhist word. Also because I was often working with people of many generations and with folks who are um, spiritual but not religious, sometimes uh, things like rule of life get a little scary. But if you talk about daily practice, which is basically the same thing, um, it's more reassuring to folks. Um, so uh, A, my definition of prayer is pretty broad and B, um, spiritual practice is even broader and they they overlap so that's another assumption um a fourth assumption in d is that what we're really talking about here is spirituality for the long haul um we are in this work for life it's long-term commit commitment and when i say this work i mean any work that any of you are doing um to, uh, with God's help, move us closer into the reign of God in very concrete ways, um, in institutions, in neighborhoods, um, in families and households. Uh, and so one of the things um, that's important, and this predates the current political situation, is how do we set up some practices in our lives, both individual and communal, that will sustain us for the long haul. Um, so this is really about the Christian life. Um, and it's also about, okay, so there are short-term efforts to do things, but um, how do we keep at it? Uh, and it's not unrelated to the question of how do we not lose hope? Uh, how do we not burn out? And Advent is a really wonderful season for us to explore that because there's so many opportunities to reflect on issues of the future and despair and hope and uh, to renew our own practice. Um, memory, attention, and hope are for us as Christians and for people in other historically bound traditions, um, the, the building blocks of prayer, both individual and communal. Um, we are uh, a faith that is anchored in history that's anchored in remembrance, um, the remembrance of Jesus, the remembrance of the prophets, um, the remembrance that the Eucharist is, it's also many other things, the remembrance of the saints broadly and narrowly conceived, the remembrance of events that have been um, times of conversion. Um, so we're anchored in that. We're also a future looking uh, faith and um, Advent in its look toward both the first and second comings of Jesus um, really focuses our attention on that. We're very much a looking forward 
uh, kind of tradition. And um, we're also a tradition that envisions, and that's true of both the Jewish and the Christian traditions, um, is that we have a kind of without, uh, to, to quote the biblical text, we have a um, without a vision, the people perish kind of approach. We need the visions. We need the stories. Now, between memory and hope, uh, sometimes our attention to the present can get a little squeezed. Um, and I found more and more that uh, a good influx, influx of um, Buddhist influence mindfulness practice, being careful and attentive to the present uh, that can be all the way from the person who's in front of us and what they're saying to, am I chewing too fast? Uh, and did I just dash out the door without saying a proper, have a good day to somebody in my household? Um, this focus on the present I'm finding is more and more important, again, because we're living amid such a deluge of responsibilities and obligations and information. So, so those are basic assumptions. Um, number two is, um, I'll go over pretty quickly, I think often when we think about how to pray, um, a lot of concerns about, am I doing it right, can come up for us. Um, or an idea about how to do it right. Um, and I want to invite you to let go of that uh, as much as you can. Um, I think in prayer, God doesn't want us to be perfect. God wants us to be honest. That's number one. Um, and it's better to, to name where we are, to begin where we are. If we're tired, we're praying from tiredness. Um, if we are um, uh, an introvert, we're praying from that. Um, if we are raising three children, we're praying differently from somebody who's a monk. Uh, and our prayer needs to be adapted to that. Um, our environment, both built environment and nature kind of environment, um, is something that shapes us. Uh, and that's where we start. Um, we also start where we are culturally. Um, from um, what we find is beautiful or meaningful. Um, that's going to come up a little bit later on when we talk about silence and noise. Um, we tend to have certain standards in our head about what prayer is while well, it's quiet and contemplative. Yes, it's that, and it can also be making a joyful noise uh, in many ways. And those are, to some extent, culturally conditioned notions of prayer and of beauty. Um, and also areas where we can stretch ourselves. Um, so with prayer, prayer has a lot to do with placing some boundaries around ourselves um, and removing ourselves from the everyday. Um, it's also about staying in the everyday with a sense of perspective. And there are ways that we can challenge ourselves in prayer. Um, Time and place, I simply wanted to draw your attention to the way that time in your life, in our lives, and place in our lives can be anchors. So, um, so think about um, what are the, do you have a prayer place in your home? Uh, and it can be an altar, it can be a rocking chair with a Bible, um, it can be a cushion, um, or you an outdoors walk and pray at the same time kind of person. Do you have an anchor? Would it help you to have an anchor? Um, if you're short on space, um, can you have a little tray? Um, can you light a candle? Um, often we need anchors. We're enfleshed beings and we're people with senses. And one of the wonderful things about our particular um, branch of the Christian tradition is that we use our senses and we use our imagination and we use space. Um, there's also... Uh, uh, a time for prayer that people have um, regularly. Um, and that's also part of the should. Um, we can talk about daily routines. There are things that are helpful to do daily, um, again, in a way that's adapted to our particular life circumstances. Um, but there are also places of spontaneous prayer. Um, I knew a woman who um, 
who would take that who was in New York who would take the subway every day and when she crossed the bridge from Brooklyn to Manhattan she would pass a couple of churches that had crosses on top and she anchored her prayer in the seeing of that cross during her commute every morning um there's another person that I um, whom I interviewed once, uh, and I said, you know, I'm hearing more and more from people that commuting time is their privileged praying time. And she said, to, she's a local Massachusetts, New England person, and she said, oh yeah, Jesus rides in the passenger seat. Um, so, uh, you know, another commuter thing is um, if you're in public transit um, too discreetly, look at the face of people around you and pray for them. Um, so there are spontaneous anchors in time and there's the, okay, I'm going to pray a psalm every morning. Um, so I just wanted to name that and, and um, we can talk about it more, but these are always anchors. Um, and they're anchors also, if you think about what the prayer book offers us, um, they're anchors. I should have said one more assumption, which is that for me, our beautiful prayer book, beautiful as it is, should be a springboard, not a stranglehold. That's my philosophy of prayer book. So. Yeah, and Jane, Jane, this is something you just said also triggered yes. for me and, and mentioning the prayer book. And, and I know you said this in your book. There are different types of prayer. Right. Say a few words, if you would, about the different types of prayer. And, and I'm just thinking also about the, the time and the place. You know, you're just giving yeah. examples of prayers. And there are different types of prayers that you yes. might different places. So say a few words about that, if you would. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think when we say prayer, um, somehow communal liturgy bops out of our head and we think about our solitary prayer. Um, it's important to see that the one is nourished by the other and that they're both really important. Um, um, prayer also is prayer with words, but it's not always prayer with words. Um, so, uh, I talk right after about beginning with the body. There's a way in which, actually, I'm going to ask you to do that. Clench your fists right now. Clench both fists, if you're able physically to do that. Okay. Now let them go and open your hands in front of us. Can you see or feel how clenched fists and open hands are different stances? And that just opening your hands and opening your body and being present to the presence of God, possibly with words, but also just with a physical stance, um, can shape your prayer, can be a prayer. Um, the book I wrote on prayer is called When in Doubt Sing, and that came out of a um, particularly difficult time in my life when I um, had some trouble praying by myself, and um, I was going through uh, depression and economic difficulty, and I found that when in doubt, one thing I could hang on to was singing. I could sing along with tapes. They were cassette tapes in those days. It was a long time ago. Um, and that that was an, an anchor for me. Um, is that, James, is that some of what you were um, getting that, at? Do you want to add that's something? A, sure. So that's some of what I was getting at. And then I was also thinking there, there's uh, prayers of Gratitude, prayers of thanksgiving. Yes, um, prayers of intercession. Prayers of right, right. Prayers of, of hope. That's um, right. That's right. Uh, back to you were talking about we're we're a visionary. We like to have visions. That's right. That's right. Kind of one of the prayers that. that's important in the work of of justice, including racial justice, um, is one of the things I have further down, which is the prayer of lament, which is a tradition as ancient as the Psalms and older. Um, so yes, so there's not, um, there is not one kind of prayer and frankly, it doesn't matter where you begin as long as it's in a way that is truthful. Um, so thanks, James. Did you want to add anything, um, again? No, I, I guess the only thing I would, would posit here in addition is, and I think you touched on this, there's prayer as an individual and then there's prayer as a group. Right. Um, and so time and place, time and place for prayer as an individual and time and place for prayer as a group. Right. And let me give you a, a couple of examples, if that's okay. Would this be a good time just to give yep. a couple of examples? Sure. Sure. 
Sure. Um, one, one is a sort of observation professional one, and one is a, um, a more um, personal one. Um, I see on the chat, which I haven't had a chance to look at but very much because I'm um, trying to look ahead okay. through my eyes. Um, someone said she practices yoga in the morning. I do as well, and I, I find it's a preparation to prayer, and it can itself um, be a prayer. But what I wanted to say is I, I met uh, a while back with um, a chapter of the um, Companions of the Society of the Holy Cross um, in North Carolina, and one of the, the calls of that group um, and of a number of other societies within our church is intercessory prayer. And I've met with people in congregations also. Um, there are ways in which prayer and the needs of the world can really be anchored in a group like that. And um, you can pray the newspaper, you can pray the news, um, you can lament as a group uh, in a way that um, doesn't, happen in quite the same way alone. I mean, the spirit moves where it will, but the spirit moves, I think, in a, a particular way in groups. And the prayer of intercession um, can be very, very powerful. And um, we can sustain each other and also hear the call of God um, in intercessory prayer. And that's often best done in small groups. I talk about living, living room size groups and cathedral size groups. Um, the more personal one is um, during uh, a year even farther back than the one I mentioned, um, I don't generally have trouble praying, but there was one year when I was in my late 20s, early 30s or so, where I was in a great state of despair about the nuclear arms race and a variety of other things. And I, I really felt kind of blank, but I went to Sunday liturgy, every liturgy, every Sunday, and I I learned a really important lesson, which is that there are times in our lives when we are carried by the prayer of others. Um, and it's really wonderful to know that and to notice that. And that's when I learned that because, you know, I was in sort of, I got nothing mode. And, and that happens, I think, to most of us. Um, so there are ways in which the community can carry us. Now, that presupposes a community that's nourishing, which is a whole other um, question. But um, uh, let me get back to also the, um, the end of the list of four so that um, we can get on to some of the specialized topics. Um, beginning with the body is always a good idea. Somebody mentioned yoga. Um, I did the thing with the clenched fists. It is... Um, one of the great discoveries that I made when I was in my late teens, early 20s, um, and exploring meditation and very sort of Eastern practices, is that there were bodily and contemplative and breathing practices in Western religion, in Christianity. And in fact, if you look at spiritual practices, they are all in one way or the other bodily practices. I mean, we stand, if we are able, for the Alleluia. It's, you know, you say, I'm, I'm not a football fan terribly much, but you stand, you know, to say hurrah. Um, there are reasons we do things. There are reasons that, um, you know, kneeling down um, or covering our eyes can express a wish or a mood that is uh, in some ways too deep for word, uh, for words, as uh, scripture says. Um, our spiritual practices of... Um, turning off the news and taking some quiet time, that's a bodily practice. You know, you're protecting your senses. Um, so, uh, so again, um, the body is a great way to focus. And it's not just that we have bodies, we are our bodies. I mean, our understanding of the body, um, the, the biblical understanding of the body, particularly in the Hebrew Bible, but also in the Gospels, um, sometimes less so in uh, some of the epistles, um, is is quite what we would call today holistic. Um, uh, and um, the practices of attention to the breath exist in Christianity as well as in the yogic and Eastern uh, traditions. Um, and they exist in very explicit ways in such things as the Jesus Prayer, which is from the Eastern Orthodox 
um, family within Christianity. Um, that is not just the uttering of the sentence, um, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Sometimes it's a little longer and sometimes a little shorter. Um, sometimes people say just Jesus and mercy. But um, this is done in keeping with the breath. Um, so um, I think that's enough on beginning with the body. I could talk forever on all of these, but I wanted to talk about foundations um, first, do you, um, James, shall we, um, yeah. so I, I think what I'd love to do now is to, to just kind of take a, uh, an opportunity for folks to type in or chime in your, your thoughts about the foundations that we've just talked about and, and any experiences you want to share examples of, 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 um, of using some of what we've been talking about would be great to, to, to hear and, and to sh for you to share with folks. So share what, what experiences you have or any questions about what uh, what we've been talking about so far in the chat or feel free to come off mute at this point and uh, to share as well um, and, and Jane one of the things I had typed to the, to the chat was I was just recently reading uh, Dancing with Life Mm -hmm. uh, which is about the, the four areas of, in, in, in Buddha, Buddhism and the 12, I guess it is, um, mm -hmm. aspects um, and, and really melding mindfulness about body and mind and spirit yeah. uh, and being intentional about um, living your life um, through experience. Yes. And that's, that is, uh, it's an, also another way of saying mindfulness practice. Yes. Um, can I say somebody here um, wrote about walking the dog um, and that's a really um, important thing. I think we, um, for many of us sitting still can be very helpful. Um, but I want to say also that walking is really conducive to prayer and meditation for many of us at all, uh, I think. And so I'm really glad um, that you mentioned walking the dog as uh, a place and time of prayer and reflection. It also brings us outdoors. And um, one of the people I quote in my book on prayer, who is a Jewish friend, said to me, you know, dogs are just great reminders um, from God because every morning they say, hot damn, isn't it a great day to be on this planet? And, you know, your dog will say that, excuse me, this is my cat here. Um, <laughs> um, you know, your dog, your dog will say that before you are able to, because dogs don't need caffeine for that. Right. So, um, Great. Um, I, I did want to just lift up, uh, Tracy is just asking, would you please better define anchors for prayer? What are uh, anchors? Thank you. Yes, perhaps I wasn't clear. So, so. You know, an anchor is um, basically a heavy piece of metal that you throw down um, when you're in a boat so that the boat doesn't move anymore and, and you can give it a, a safe place to be, a port. Um, and so I mentioned, um, I use anchor as uh, in the sense of something to hang on to when you're kind of adrift, um, when you're kind of moving this way and that. Um, it's, uh, and you asked the question of, I mentioned a cross on a church. Um, yes, I may not have been clear enough. It's a reminder to pray. So this woman that I know, um, who would take the subway from Brooklyn to Manhattan, every time she saw the cross at the top of one particular church would say a prayer, um, or it would refocus her on the fact that she wanted to live her day doing God's work um, wherever she was. And before that, she might have been kind of, you know, feeling the subway um, move her around or her mind wandering about work. And the cross was a, um, a way of focusing her. Um, that can be true of other visual things. Many traditions pray with icons, um, with a cross or crucifix, with a picture of Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, pictures of the saints. Um, some people are anchored, are held by music. Um, does that, am I making sense, Tracy, is that uh, helpful? 
And um, is there anything else um, that wasn't clear? Oh, that's really wonderful. When I hear Siren, you, you just wrote, I pray for the victims and the rescue personnel. So that makes sense. That's a really beautiful example of what I would call occasional prayer. So you're doing a really wonderful thing here, which is that you are, you're in your environment, something comes in that you couldn't predict, and you are uh, looking at it and experiencing it as a call to prayer. And you're responding to something daily as a call to prayer. Um, that's just what I was talking about. Yeah. So there are anchors that can be regular, you know, like the the cushion on the floor with the Bible or the rocking chair. Um, uh, and there can also be things like the the siren. Yeah. Great example. Thank you. Great. So just in the, in the interest of time, um, yep. I think I want to move us along a little bit and. Yep. Uh, this has been a great discussion about the foundations and let's take that foundation or those foundations, those frameworks and assumptions and, and thinking about how we pray, when we pray, spiritual practices, and take a look at uh, the remaining, uh, what is it, uh, eight mm -hmm. items on the list. Uh, because we have a limited amount of time, we're not going to be able to get to each of these, but I'd, I'd like for us to choose, uh, we've got maybe three of them if you wouldn't mind uh just typing in the chat which three you would like for us to or for, like for jane to, to talk a bit about and for us to to consider yeah. so just take a minute to to look at uh the rest of the items on the list and type in the chat uh which ones you'd like to talk about yeah. uh, so we have a five and a nine and then there's a one 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. 11 and 12. Okay. Yep. Yep. 11 and 12. Okay. Anyone else? So I'm going to suggest we focus on certainly number 12. Yeah. Um, and number 11. And how about... Uh, Five, maybe? Mm -hmm. Nine. Um, or lament, yeah. Uh, I'm going to suggest we focus on lament. Okay. So that would be, that's number eight, right? So nine. 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 So nine, 11, and 12. Let's, uh, let's uh, mm -hmm. focus on those for, the, for about 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes at most, and then we'll have a final um, kind of conversation and question and answer mm -hmm. wrap up. Um, yeah. Start with number nine. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to start with twelve. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, because this this brings in the the communal. Um, and bear in mind that I'm just touching on things, and um, you know, if any of you want to have individual conversations, we can do that. Um, this was suggested uh, to me in a conversation I had. Um, recently with um, someone who was saying to me, you know, we, we really need to find new ways of being church, and who talked to me about something that is going on within our Diocese of Massachusetts as a kind of experiment, but it's also a national group. And Karen, you may know no, more about it. Um, uh, I think it's the Leadership Development Institute that's involved. Yes. And they... I've seen it also in other forms elsewhere that um, people are finding that their parish group or their social activist group isn't quite nourishing them in what they hope church would be. And so, um, and I, I'm being more vague in general here um, uh, for purposes of both confidentiality and, and um, just trying to make this um, accessible, reachable, understandable, um, that um, I've heard of this, um, these small groups where people 
pray together regularly and try to keep each other accountable um, in the work of justice that they're doing and to do it in a way that is freeing. So that keeps people accountable, but is not sort of standing over people saying, you didn't do this this week, but rather trying to form uh, a community of friendship um, and uh, responsibility and prayer um, and reflection. That really is what church needs to be, but they're doing it on a smaller scale and a more intense scale. And I guess what I want to say about that is that there are many forms of that that are present in our church structure as it exists, and there are also many little things popping up, and there's not one way to do this. But there, there are always some components that I've seen that are life-giving when they are together. Um, I saw this way back in um, in my Roman Catholic days in a group I was in at the Paulist Center in Boston, um, where we always had a combination of action, reflection, as in study, think things through, um, and prayer, and the fourth dimension, which was fiesta, partying, and that we tried to live those things together. Um, and we found that it was helpful to have all of those. Um, so um, those are some new new ways of being church that in some sense are also very old. Um, and I guess what I wanted to draw people's attention to there is um, that um, we need more and more to use our imaginations. Um, uh, I'm seeing Karen Wright attending to where the spirit is bubbling up that might be new. The spirit is not necessarily bubbling up between the walls, the four walls of a church, um, uh, or um, in the places we expect. It is there too, um, but it could be among people who don't tell the story of salvation the way we do, or who tell it differently. Um, and one of the ways that's a good way for us to stretch is not just what are new and old ways of being church, but what are ways that we can be a guest and visit? Um, you know, is everybody who is involved in anti-racism work, um, have, have you been a guest? Have you gone to pray with and learn from um, a church from a different racial group, economic group, cultural group? Um, have you experienced in your body what that's like? Um, have you experienced in your comfort level what, what's that like? Um, and have you done it with a buddy? You know, you don't have to do it um, alone. Somebody wrote a little note here too. There was just a chat. It was just Elizabeth who said, and part of finding these new ways is being ready and open to speak about our faith, uh, which we can struggle with because it's often countercultural. Um, right. And I, what just ran through my mind is, you know, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, um, I am there also. And that's church. It is. Yeah, it is. And I, I, um, it, you know, we've always thought it that way, but because we, in the Episcopal Church at least, we, um, we're people who like structure, you know, we like set right. prayers and we like, right. the, and that, that's the good part of the old, you know, again, springboard, not stranglehold, is that um, these structures also hold us up. Advent holds us in a particular way and helps us focus on a particular aspect of our faith and ways of being in the world and the Christmas season will do that and Epiphany will do that and the Lenten season will do that. Um, but there are different and new ways of living the seasons. Um, I remember once leading a, a retreat, um, in this case it was an online retreat on um, food and fasting during Lent and you know, fasting is a very traditional ancient practice in Christian tradition, we can also learn a lot from Muslim and Jewish practices of fasting. 
Um, but there are also whole ways of looking at the realities of food and nourishment and fasting, both in our own practice in our households and in the issues of justice and sustainability around us. So um, let loose the imagination and, and find allies. Um, uh, and there's usually, there's usually somebody um, you know, who may be thinking and feeling what you are. But it does, as Elizabeth said, um, it takes some courage to witness to our faith and, and witness to our questions and our doubts and our struggles. Um, God always works with that. At, at least that's my belief, and I sure hope so. Um, uh, Good. Uh, so I, I want to move us on. Yep. Yeah. Um, how about number 11? Quick anchors for prayer in the work of justice. Talk a little bit more about yeah. uh, social justice and racial reconciliation and, and ways to kind of center ourselves yeah. almost and anchor yeah. ourselves for prayer in that regard. Um, that may lead to, to talking about lamenting as well, but it but may, uh, yeah. Um, let me let me write. Um, let me tell you some things that I wrote down, and it it may not be the kind of thing you had in mind. So um, let me know. These are kind of how-tos and anchors, sort of where do I start? Um, and um, there, there are some things that are like old favorites and there are some things that are new. Um, and then I also want to talk about a litany for racial reconciliation and um, processions. And so um, I think old favorites in a new light um, are actually some of the anchors we can use. Um, the, the German theologian Dorothee Zola, who um, uh, died in 2003, was born in 1928, um, talked about how every Christian needs to eat a psalm for breakfast every morning and chew on it. Um, and um, I have found again and again that returning to the psalms, um, both the ones that match my mood and the ones that don't, um, is incredibly nourishing for me as a Christian and in the work of justice. Um, I often find if I don't have time or energy or community for morning prayer, the one thing that I don't let go of is the psalm of the day. And it's quite amazing how much talk there is of um, the attention that God pays and that we need to pay to people who are disenfranchised. Um, and that's not all the Psalms are. Um, many are Psalms of lament and Psalms of praise, and there's, there's much, much more than that in the Psalms, but um, they're ancient and wonderful anchors. Um, there's also an exercise um, that I encourage, um, and I'd be happy to send people the how-to after if you ask. We can do a mailing of writing your own Psalm and I'll talk about that a little more with women. Um, the Lord's Prayer is also a wonderful anchor when you think about the components of that prayer and you say it not automatically, but slowly. Um, you know, thy kingdom come, or if you want to change the language to something more inclusive, kingdom is a really nice one. Um, the Latina theologian Ada Maria Isasi Diaz used that uh, kingdom, um, you know, the place where we are and will be kin together. Just settling ourselves into your reign, your realm, may it come. Um, and, you know, the, the really tough run, the really tough one of forgiving uh, as, as uh, we forgive those who trespass against us, that's, I don't know about where you stumble, but, you know, that's the one that sort of, uh, <laughs> um, uh, that I stumble on and that, um, you know, that's a great daily reminder. Um, I want to talk about those meetings. It's a total change of topic, but it's related to anchors. The meetings, you know, we all have meetings, right? Does everybody here not have meetings in their lives? Okay. So I'm going to assume that we all have meetings of various kinds and meetings, meetings, groups that meet. Matt yes. asking about that. So committee meetings, uh, meetings with groups, um, faculty meetings, Girl Scout leader meetings, 
AA meetings that. So um, at some point or another, in one of the meetings you've been to in the last month, you've gotten really irritated. Um, and maybe at a particular person. And what I have found that is helpful at those meetings, um, and sometimes you may not be able to bear to look at somebody's face or to think about your own face, is to look at people's hands. Hands are a wonderful anchor for prayer. Um, I think, you know, babies' hands are particularly beautiful, but there's also no beauty like a hand that has lived a long time. Um, and that has wrinkles and scars and calluses. And it can help you recenter during one of those meetings if you look at the hands of the person who's irritating you or if you look at people's hands and, um, and look at what the hands are saying. Uh, it can reorient us towards the humanity uh, and the beauty of people in a very simple way. And I find that that can be an anchor, especially because we all have meetings in our lives. Um, another anchor certainly is the breath. Um, and this is, it's the one bodily function that most of us can control in some way. There are variations um, of that, obviously, if, um, you know, if we're having some challenges in our breathing, whether temporary or um, chronic or permanent, um, but uh, staying um, or becoming anchored in our breath um, is not just something that's helpful when you're nervous before a job interview or before giving a speech, but um, if you're waiting for a traffic light, on foot or in your car, um, it is a way of anchoring that may not yet be prayer and may be prayer, but it is certainly a path into the kind of attentiveness um, that is a core part of prayer. And um, by focusing on the breath, I, I guess the simplest thing I'd say, um, this again is a, a whole other um, workshop um, is to slow down your breathing. We can do that. You can't, um, most of us can't slow down our heartbeat, you know, or control our digestion beyond trying to eat things that agree with our digestion. Um, but we can slow down our breath. And the first thing to do is to simply be mindful of it. Um, it's quite amazing if you uh, observe your breath and don't do anything to it. Um, Actually, let's, let's do that right now. I'm going to be quiet for about 20 seconds. And don't try and do anything to your breath. Just observe the rising and falling of your breath and where it's located. Are you breathing from your belly or from your upper chest? Does anything hurt when you breathe? Is your breath rapid, fast? or slow? Can you feel the beating of your heart? All those kinds of things. And take note right now of what you noticed. And then um, take a long, slow, deep breath. Do it in a way that's comfortable for your body. Um, don't get lightheaded. Um, if you're able to breathe through your nose, that's optimal, but if not, um, anything is good. And breathe very slowly, so this time intentionally. Breathe in, and breathe out through your belly. Nobody's looking at you. You can stick your belly out. We're not seeing it. You don't have to look like you have flat abs. Um, women especially, but not just women, tend to breathe from the top of the chest and um, breathing into the belly is, um, again, there's a longer, more yoga-ish kind of way of talking about that. And breathe out slowly. Um, one of the things that I recommend is, and I learned this from a friend and also in, in classes, is to um, take some time to be aware of your breath and then take three very slow, deep breaths. Um, and in the first part, simply notice without judgment, which is in itself very hard to do. 
Um, and then in the second part, to slow down. Um, and that is, that's a mindfulness exercise, but it is also a way to help us to listen better both to ourselves um, and to the voice of God. Did you notice anything, any of you, in watching your own breathing? Just now, it's a little difficult to do this um, in a webinar, but um, I figured we'd try. Did you notice anything? Um, and do you notice anything? Is there anything that strikes you uh, about your breath or your body when you notice your breathing? Just breathing. Just breathing. Um, you, you may be, uh, I feel like my heart rate decreased, somebody says, uh, Matt, yeah, it's just breathing. Um, Matt, actually, um, uh, you've, uh, maybe consciously or maybe not, um, reminded me of a story, uh, that Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist Vietnamese monk, uh, told, uh, about the Buddha, the Buddha, um, said, somebody came to the Buddha and said, sir, what do you do? And he said, well, you know, we eat, we walk, and we sit. And the person said, but sir, everybody eats and walks and sits. And the Buddha said, when we eat, we know we're eating. When we breathe, we know we're breathing. And we don't always know that we're breathing when we're breathing. So it's just breathing, but uh, Matt, that can be hard for folks, actually. Um, yep. uh, so I, I'm seeing really we've got about three minutes left. Okay. And uh, we and covered I, two of the three topics, and that's 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 fine. I, I want to just get. Oh, I want to talk about laments. So, if you could just very quickly, and, yes. and I'm wondering if you can tie it also because we, we spent a bit of time on quick anchors. Yes. Um, but I, I'm not sure we got into the anchors for prayer and the work of justice. And I think there's yeah. a nice tie in between yeah. Yeah. So, anchors for prayer for justice and lamenting. Yes. Um, uh, so um, lament is crucial to the work of justice. Um, naming the injustice, naming the suffering, naming what makes us and others angry. Um, is something that we need to do. We need to ritualize it. Um, we have a lot to learn from Latino, Latina communities about processions and how church uh, and liturgy and ritual exist in processions, um, uh, in stations of the cross. Um, uh, again, we could do a, you know, a whole follow-up on this. Um, we also have in our traditions um, some classics like the Psalms and like the spirituals, um, which are the great classics in African-American spiritual and social tradition. It is no accident that during the civil rights movement, many of the spirituals were revived, some of them with new words, um, and they were and are songs that testify to great sorrow and sometimes testify without naming God, but they presuppose that God is there. I'm seeing Matt point to a book called Prophetic Lament. Exactly. Um, composing litanies, um, and I can send out a litany for racial justice that's been used in different parts of the country that I compose, but you know, we many people have that gift um, uh, to compose that. So using the tradition of a litany, of a prayer, um, that itself is a kind of procession of words that has a rhythmic call and response. Um, so uh, lament really is the beginning of protest. Um, and sometimes when we have no energy to protest, we can name. Um, there have been times in the lives of oppressed peoples when survival itself was protest. And I think we need not to skip over that. One of the things that African-American women theologians, particularly womanist theologians, the name um, they use to speak of themselves, uh, have taught us is that struggle for liberation 
is not the only place um, where um, uh, resistance to evil happens. Mere survival is not nothing. Just surviving for many people for whom life is so hard, just staying in place, um, and perhaps some of you have experienced that, survival is something in itself and just being able to speak um let me let me give one example um some of you maybe have heard um of the mothers and grandmothers of the plaza de mayo um these are uh, women who were the mothers and grandmothers of people who had disappeared without a trace um many of whom died some of whom did not um, during the dictatorship in Argentina in the 70s, particularly in the 80s. Um, and these women would come to the Plaza de Mayo, which is the big um, plaza in the middle of the city of Buenos Aires. And they would come with the signs with the names of the disappeared. Um, I can't remember if they were dressed in black or white. I think there was also a kind of unspoken dress code. And they would stand there. And they did this year after year after year and to remind people that these folks had disappeared. And, you know, the media picked up on it and the, it wasn't everything, but it was truly necessary that here was somebody who was um, white headscarves. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, and somebody says you, you had a chance to, um, is it Elizabeth? Um, to circle the plaza with them. There also have been, um, uh, there's been some um, uh, killings of young women in um, Mexico, very close to the border. There's a wonderful book by Nancy Pineda Madrid um, that is on, um, it's called um, Suffering and Salvation in Ciudad Juarez. Um, and um, there have been lots of killings of poor young women um, and whose lives are seen not to matter. And again, their parents, especially their mothers, um, have had processions, rituals in the street that draw from the riches of their religious and cultural tradition that are protests against the violence and that are saying in this case the lives of young brown poor mexican women matter um and again this is a way to protest and to survive um i hate to do this but we're past our time um and so much here thank you jane so much for for sharing um, thoughts on, on prayer and, and especially how it relates to this work of uh, racial reconciliation and cultural awareness and multicultural competency and just talking about the, the city of Juarez and, and Brazil and the different cultures there and yet the same, same, um, same angst and need for justice just, just comes through yeah. with all of this. Yeah. So uh, would love to uh, close with a closing prayer. And um, I see Reverend Karen is here. Um, would you like to offer us a closing prayer, Reverend Karen? I would, can you hear? Um... We can hear you. Okay, great. So, so let us pray. Gracious God, in uh, the coming, in this Advent season, where we anticipate the coming of your son. Please know that we may not understand that Jesus is coming within each of us. As the new year dawns, in the midst of so many troubling events, help us to see your dawning in our lives in the unusual places in the breathing, in the beating of our hearts, in the faces of the annoying person in the meeting. Help us to be that face of Jesus as we meet with others. Help us to be your peace and the change that we would like to see in this world. All this we ask 
in anticipation of the birth of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. And so that, that concludes our webcast for this month, for tonight. And our next webcast will be January 16th. And the topic will be uh, key concepts and definitions in anti-racism training uh, based on a, a document that I'm crafting along with the Executive Council uh, Committee on Anti-Racism. So hopefully we'll see you then. And until then, have a, a great month and happy holidays. And we'll speak with you around the province. Good night. Thanks, Good night. everybody, Thanks. for coming. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And feel free to follow up and write if you there's anything I can, resources I can share. Thank you. Great. Thank you.